Uh, if we zoom in on the Earth, you can see that yes, the moon really is there. <laughs> it's part of the simulation. Uh, again, again, because these are so, the distances are so big, uh, I had to exaggerate the size of the moon and the Earth. So it looks like it's kind of skimming along the surface, but it's not. Okay. So let me close that one. I have one more planet. Uh, simulation to show you. Okay, so here's a simulation that involves just the Earth and the Moon only. Okay? So I want to tell you about uh, something that really scared me as a child. When I learned about the Moon and I learned about gravitation, somebody told me that all the time the Earth and the Moon are pulling each other towards each other. And the Moon is really big. So at this moment, it happens to be going around in a nice circle or ellipse. But what if it got shaken somehow, okay, and came towards the Earth? If it got sort of knocked out of that orbit, well, the Earth is relentlessly it's pulling on the Moon. Who's to say it's not going to pull it right in? so that they crash. <clears throat> okay, or, or let's put it this way. Uh, suppose there is some uh, evil guy. Uh, and he thinks of an evil plan. <laughs> so here's the Earth. Here's the moon, and at this moment the moon is going nicely around like that, and he thinks, okay, I'm going to uh, use my, my money that I stole uh, to put a bomb on the other side of the moon, directly opposite from the earth, and I'm going to blow that bomb so that the moon is going to be knocked towards the Earth like that. And uh, then the moon is going to, well, maybe it will spiral a little, little bit, but it's going to crash and destroy the whole Earth. <laughs> Unless the government pays me some billion dollars. Okay, would that work? Have you ever been afraid of that? <laughs> well, now yes. Now yes. <laughs> okay, so let's let's look at this from above and let's simulate that that situation. Okay, so I'm going to run the simulation. This is again, this is an accurate uh, simulation of the moon going around the Earth. I took the distance from the, the data that's that's available and the, and the velocity and so on. So this is really what that orbit looks like, I'm looking from above. And so I, I programmed this now so that if I press this button, the moon is going to be shook, shaken towards the Earth, uh, and let's see if it crashes. So are you ready? Three, two, one. Oh. So you saw it changed. It was jolted towards a little bit more. So what happened? It's still in orbit, right? It's, it's in a new orbit. Now it's in a more elliptical orbit, not as circular as before, with the Earth as one of the two focal points. But it's, it's still in orbit. It's not spiraling in to crash. Okay, so maybe he didn't hit it hard enough. Let's try again. <laughs> So three, two, one. Okay, I hit it again. Did you see it uh, suddenly changed? And, but still, the evil plan is not working. <laughs> well, that's a relief because there can also be asteroids, not necessarily evil plans, but things can collide and cause changes in, in speed. 
So what we learned from this is that an orbit in the solar system, an orbit is not an unstable situation. That's what normally happens. If two things were to crash, that would be very highly unusual. You'd have to really be pointed exactly at each other, because if not, then they will get into an orbit situation. And that's what you can sort of, you can play with this and see it from these kinds of simulations. Let's hit it several more times and see if we can get a crash. <laughs> oh, I think I lost the move. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's coming back. That's not as funny as Yeah, that might also be bad, so maybe he won anyway. <laughs> You can run your own evil plans once you program your simulation like this and see if they work before you spend a billion dollars to kind of fall. Mm -hmm. We can revisit any of those if you want to ask questions or want to see, see me play with them uh, at the end. Let me show you, so there are two more examples. This one is something called Boyd's. It's a, it was a, a name given by the, the guy who first made this simulation. So he was interested to see if he could model the behavior of birds or flies. You know, when you have a big group of birds, or even a not so big one, uh, when they fly, they kind of stay together in a flock. And the same thing happens with big groups of flies or mosquitoes. Uh, what would you say? Mosquitoes. Uh, so. They, they tend to kind of stay together. But if you think about it, what is causing that to happen? Each one of those birds individually is not in charge of the behavior of all of them. He can only control his own flying. So how does it happen that you get this whole group of birds sort of flocking together like that? So somebody, I, I don't know the name, but somebody proposed this model. So. I'm going to create a model of birds flying around. So in my model, the birds will just be particles again. So the birds, let me draw them like a V or something. So there's a bird. Here's another one. Maybe another one. Actually, that's not a good shape, but... Okay, so something like this. Imagine that those birds are flying around uh, at this moment. <coughs> so again, each bird has a... It's, just think of it as a particle, as an idealized approximation to a bird or a fly. Uh, which will suffice for our model. That particle has a mass, position, velocity, acceleration, and force. So to specify this model, I need to tell you how the forces are described. So where do the forces come from? So first, each of those birds, let's call them, will try not to collide with nearby birds. So that's the first thing, this bird here, He's going to look in his immediate view, like that. He sees two birds there, and he doesn't want to hit them. So he looks at their position, and he says, I'm going to steer away from that. OK, so this is the force, force due to what I would call separation. So they try not to collide with each other. Well, that's a sensible thing, and probably real birds are doing that. <clears throat> okay, but second thing, even at the same time as trying to avoid the birds right in front of him, that bird is going to steer towards the average direction of all the other birds. 
So it looks at all of these birds and looks at their velocities. Maybe something like that. He takes the average of all of those velocities and steers towards that. I guess it would be like that. Well, something like that. So the average velocity of all the other curves. Uh, and then finally, uh, the third force acting on this bird is what we call cohesion. So this time he looks at the average position of all the other birds. So even while trying to avoid the really close ones in front, he will steer towards the average position of all of the birds in the flock. So that average position would be uh, somewhere about here. So he's going to steer towards that. Okay, so all of those are very simple rules for the behavior of the birds. Uh, and you can program that on a computer pretty easily. I, the code will look something similar to what I had before. I didn't include it here. But let me show you the, uh, the program itself. OK, so here's a system of uh, some 20, 20 or so birds. And they're going to behave according to that. And also, they are going to stay on the screen. So if they hit the sides of the screen, they're just going to be stopped. It's kind of like if they land on a tree or, or something like that. OK, so watch how this looks. So they landed for a moment. Painfully, maybe. Uh, so this screen is a bit too small. They get stuck on the sides very frequently. But, uh, you can sort of see you can sort of see what looks like a clump of flies or a group of birds flying together. So the interesting thing is that yeah, they do kind of stay together and somewhat randomly uh, wander, but all in a flock, and they're not always sort of going at the same speed. Sometimes one or two get out ahead, and then the others kind of join in to try to catch. Uh, all of that happens because of those three rules only that we implemented in the model. So I didn't, I didn't tell the birds to flock. It just happens because of those rules. Uh, so that tells us that maybe, maybe the birds in real, in real life are just operating on rules, simple rules like that. Well, it doesn't tell us for sure, but maybe that's what they are doing. Because after all, it looks kind of like this. And it makes sense that they might uh, operate on that kind of information. So this is a neat one to play with. Uh, there are some online versions of this where you can go and, and play with the parameters a little bit if you like. Or you can program your own. It's not very kind of mesmerizing. It would make a good screensaver. <laughs> OK, so that's, that's all I wanted to do for that example. So last example, and then we'll, we'll stop, uh, is something called rigid body dynamics. Uh, so this is. Basically, this is the system where you have objects that are not flexible, and you watch how they sort of fly around and spin and knock into each other, uh, and as they do in real life. Let, let's say if you had a bunch of blocks, uh, like what Julia here will be playing with soon, uh, children's blocks that you stack up, and then you can knock them over and see how this looks. Uh, well, you can model those blocks by just real polyhedra, real cubes in a mathematical sense, or spheres if you have some spheres in your set. So again, each of those blocks in your system will have a mass, 
maybe a density if it's not evenly distributed, but let's just for simplicity sake it's just a uniform density. So a mass, position, velocity, acceleration, and force, just like before. So that governs their motion, again, according to Newton's second law. Um, but now we also have the, the blocks have a orientation in space. So this time we're looking at acceleration and force, but it also has an orientation, right? You can pick that block up and rotate it around in a variety of ways, and it can be spinning, that orientation can be changing, and that's what we call the angular velocity. Blocks, when, when you let the system evolve, those blocks can collide with each other. And when two rigid objects collide, uh, well, you have to detect that. And that's kind of a tricky part about programming these things. But as you run the simulation, you have to watch for those occasions when the blocks strike, collide. And when that happens, uh, we appeal to what's called conservation of momentum. So this tells you how they will kind of bounce off each other and also the conservation of angular momentum. So when two, uh, say, spinning objects hit each other, they will sort of change the way that they spin.